The Seven Year Itch is a 1955 romantic comedy that was directed by Billy Wilder. And this was all from a screenplay that he co-wrote with George Axelrod. The film stars Marilyn Monroe and Tom Ewell. And it contains one of the most iconic pop culture images of the 20th century, which is Marilyn Monroe standing on a subway grate as her white dress is blown upwards by a passing train. The story begins with a man whose family is away on an annual summer holiday. This New Yorker named Richard Sherman decides he has the opportunity to live a bachelor's life while they're gone, that he can eat and do whatever he wants and basically enjoy life without his wife and son. He goes back and forth in his head and the voices in it that tell him what to do and what not to do. But then the beautiful ditzy blonde from the apartment above catches his eye, and they soon start spending time together. It's all innocent enough, though, but there is little doubt, though, that Sherman is really attracted to her. Any lust that he may be feeling is played out completely in his own imagination. The screen rights for the movie were acquired for $255,000 as part of a 1953 agreement with Axelrod, and the contract stated that the film could not be released before January 31st of 1956 because the play that he had written under the same name was still making a lot of money. When 20th Century Fox head Daryl Zanuck grew impatient with the project, he paid Axelrod another $175,000 to move up the movie debut to June 3rd of 1955. The director, Billy Wilder, and Axelrod had somewhat of a contemptuous first meeting. Both the director and Axelrod worked on the movie adaptation. Axelrod, on his very first day, brought the script in from the play and showed it to Wilder and told him that he thought they could use this as a guide. Wilder quickly replied to him, Fine, we'll just use it as a doorstop. Because of the Hayes Code that was in existence at the time, there were some real key differences between the play and the movie. In the play, Sherman and the girl actually have sex. However, the production code dictated that adultery must never be the subject of comedy or laughter. Wilder thought he had a way around this that he could work into the movie, and he suggested that they have Sherman's maid find a hairpin when making up his bed, implying that an adulterous act had taken place there without showing it. Studio head Zanuck refused to give Wilder the go-ahead. He didn't even want him to mention this idea to the head censor, Jeffrey Sherlock. Instead, in the film, Sherman only fantasizes about cheating with the girl. Wilder, looking back on the limitations that he had to deal with at the time, felt like that he should have waited until the 1970s to make this movie. The girl, played by Marilyn Monroe, had no name, and that was for a reason. The truth is that they could never think of a name to really fit the girl. Both Axelrod and Wilder worked on it, and they just couldn't come up with one, so they left her without one. A scene involving Yogi Berra was cut from the film. Footage featuring the Yankees catcher and pitcher, Steady Eddie, that had been filmed during an Indians-Yankees game on September 1st, 1954, was meant to be a part of the gossip sequence when Sherman daydreams about news of his activities with the girl go spreading throughout New York City. Now, Marilyn Monroe completely annoyed the director with her tardiness. He stated that he would get very angry at her because she wasn't punctual at all. And this was probably the beginnings of the downfall that Marilyn Monroe and himself had. This continued on when they worked on another project together in 1959 called Some Like It Hot. She completely drove him crazy during that shoot, and it really broke up their friendship. Now, you see a lot of potato chip eating by Marilyn Monroe in the movie, and a company called Bell Chips 
delivered cases of their chips to the set, hoping that they would be used as a prop in the movie. This was at the time a West Coast regional brand that was trying to go national. When the director ended up casting these chips in the role, the potato chip brand became famous. However, the company went completely out of business in 1995. New York City onlookers for the dress blowing up scene were so loud, this shoot had to be completely done again in Hollywood. Originally, this scene was shot in New York on September 15, 1954, at 1 in the morning. It happened on Lexington Avenue and 52nd Street, and this was in front of a large crowd estimated to be between 1,000 and 5,000 spectators. Also in the crowd was Marilyn Monroe's husband, Joe DiMaggio, and he was reportedly embarrassed and angry about this scene. The scene was reshot in Hollywood on the 20th Century Fox lot, and it took them about 40 takes to get the footage they wanted. They had crew members fighting to work on this shoot and to be the one to turn on the ventilator in the shaft below. That would be a heck of a story to tell about what you did at work that day. That dress she wore during that shoot and that's prominent in the movie sold for $5.6 million in June of 2011. Actress Debbie Reynolds, who is a collector of Hollywood memorabilia, put it up for auction. When it eventually sold, it said that Reynolds was completely in tears after the bidding had ended. During the filming of the movie, Marilyn was married to Joe DiMaggio. They had met in 1952 when Joe had just ended his career as a legendary New York Yankee. Marilyn, though, was at the beginning of hers, and she was on the verge of becoming an international superstar. She initially was reluctant to even date him and wasn't sure what she thought about him. She thought he was really an egomaniac that was spoiled by fame. During their first date at dinner, he barely spoke, and she was intrigued by this. Men never ignored her. DiMaggio was obsessed with Monroe. He saw her through his narcissistic lens, and he was just tickled to death to be the one chosen to be with one of the world's most desirable women. But he also wanted her to wear high neckwear blouses and low hemlines and to quit being a movie star something she was not about to do. He was completely possessive about his relationship with her. He laid down ground rules for her, things that made her terribly uncomfortable. And all this was coming to a head during the filming of The Seven-Year Itch. DiMaggio said that he would have to approve all of her films and that she was never to be semi-dressed and that she needed to break out of the dumb blonde typecasting this was a point she agreed on, though, and he told her that she was never to outshine him in any way. And when she did, he'd sleep in another bedroom and go for days without ever speaking to her. On many occasions during this shoot, when DiMaggio felt like he was losing control of her, he would beat her up. This happened more than once. They would have to put special makeup on Marilyn to hide the bruises. Marilyn felt completely suffocated as the relationship continued. Filled with anxiety, Marilyn began to drink and to take sedatives to dull the pain. She also began having an affair with her voice coach that complicated things even more. Finally, in October of 1954, she filed for divorce from him, citing mental cruelty. All this was about the time that Marilyn started taking a downhill spiral into the mental health abyss. But DiMaggio never stopped trying to win her back. He started going to therapy sessions for anger management, he loaned her money, and he never lost hope that he and Marilyn would at some point remarry. After Marilyn's death, Every week, until his own death in 1999, he had fresh roses delivered to her crypt twice a week. Take a look back at this classic and iconic movie from the 1950s. It's always a fun one to watch. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll continue to chase the classics.